All right. Okay. So um, I'll try to um, invent some reasonable homework problems um, either tonight or at the latest, um, I guess, Wednesday night. Um, uh, now, we were talking last time about um, functional derivatives, but or, which are also called variational derivatives. Um, but I think before I, before I do that, uh, continue with that uh, uh, this, uh, subject, I think I ought to go back and do um, carefully what um, I sort of hand waved um, last time on Wednesday. Um, but before I start to fill that in, are there any questions? All right. The, the part that I sort of hand wave, remember last time what we did was we were, we computed, um, Basically, um, what we call Z0 of J, which was um, um, this is for the free theory, so this is the ground state of the free theory, and it was the time ordered product of E to the integral of J of X phi of x, t4 of x, thank you. And um, we computed this and we found that if we had um, j of x just being uh, delta x minus x1 plus delta of x minus x2, in other words, two point charges that are stationary throughout all time. We computed this and um, we found that it was um, equal to uh, e to the 1 over 4 pi r e to the minus r integral minus infinity plus infinity dx zero. Um, and uh, I wanted to show you why this, this actually, um, uh, I'm sorry, what is this j of x again? Is it j, j of x is a it's a mathematical device. It's a C number current. And so this particular C number current is the C number current associated with two stationary particles that are just sitting at x1 and x2 for infinite amounts of time. And what is the C number current? Excuse me? And what is the C number current? All right, good question. This is, just, this is old pre-World War II jargon, actually. Cool. I, I just, that's off. Sorry. No, not it. Um, in, in the early days of quantum mechanics, at least, uh, I don't know if this was true in Germany, but it was certainly true in the United States, there was a big distinction between complex numbers and operators. And of course, that's a legitimate huge distinction. Um, and the complex numbers were called C numbers. The operators were called Q numbers because the position operator Q was Q was the simplest Q. The position operator was the simplest operator. And so when I say a C number current, I just mean that we're not quantizing J. But of course here, this is also a C number. In fact, it's a real number, phi of x, because we're past. Oh, I'm sorry. No, here it's a field. And so as an operator, but um, we saw that this thing was, so let me just do this. This um, uh, 
let's see, what's our nice formula for this? This is, I've got so many expressions here. E to the one half integral j of x delta of x minus x prime j of x prime uh, d fourth x d fourth x prime. Where, of course, delta of x minus x prime, these are four vectors, is an integral e to e to the i p x minus x prime, that's a dot product over p squared plus m squared d fourth p over minus four. Okay, so this is the Feynman propagator in Euclidean space. This is just the four-dimensional dot product. And the nice thing about Euclidean space is you don't have to screw around with the minus signs. You don't have to raise or lower indices. Um, uh, so this is just p0 squared plus p1 squared plus p2 squared plus p3 squared. And this is p0 x0 minus x0 prime plus p1 x1 minus x1 prime and so forth. Okay, so if you take this expression and this formula, put it in here, you get that, which is what we did on Wednesday. Um, and now what I wanted to say is that this in fact is e to the minus uh, let us say beta delta E, where delta E is the difference in energy between the ordinary Hamiltonian, which is a half integral pi squared plus grad phi squared plus m squared phi squared, and the interacting Hamiltonian, which is h0 um, my, it turns out there's an extra minus on it. Um, J of x, phi of x, d cube x. And J, of course, here, being this J, this is a time independent J. So, um, so what I want to show you is this little bit here. Are we sort of clear? Is there D3x, that's supposed to be 3 Yeah, this is D3x, and this is also, sorry, this is also D3x. Yeah. So, let's see, we've got a, I'm running out of trumpet soon. Sorry, which of those expressions is equal to uh, e to the minus beta delta E? Delta E is the ground state energy of this Hamiltonian minus the ground state energy of that Hamiltonian. Right, but which of the expressions on the board is equal to E to the minus beta delta E? Um, this whole thing. That was E0. This is equal to this, is equal to that, is equal to that, is equal to that. Okay, thank you. And now why, why, why is this the case? Well, If we look at, I, I put some of these notes, these are the notes of some of the lectures. Um, what we were doing, we were saying that the mean value in the ground state of some time-ordered product of, of Euclidean field operators is a ratio of path integrals this one is just phi of x1, phi of xn. And then we have e to the minus integral h of phi, e4 of x, e phi, and it's divided by e to the h of phi, e4 of x, e phi. And, um, this integral of h of x d 
d4 of x is something that we can call s of v. This is the Euclidean um, action, and it occurs here with um, a minus sign. So this extra minus sign here means that when you have, in other words, we can write this as integral of phi e to the minus s of uh, phi d phi divided by e to the minus s of phi. Wait, what are we rewriting as that? Excuse me? What are we rewriting as that? Are we rewriting that equation as? I'm just rewriting this in this way. In other words, this, what we saw here was that this was a this was basically the energy density, and the energy density integrated over space-time is what we also call a Euclidean action. And because of this minus sign, in order to have either the plus j phi, you need a minus sign there. In the, the version I put up uh, over the weekend, uh, or maybe on Wednesday night or Thursday, I had that minus sign on. But anyway, it doesn't really matter that much. Okay, so this, now, how do we compute any of this? Well, in particular, what we were doing to get this, remember, is we started out with something e to the minus beta h, essentially. Okay, and, um, So in other words, this thing that, that got us to the path integral was essentially constructed out of things like this, e to the minus epsilon h0, that's this thing. minus integral j of x phi of x d cubed x. So it was a bunch of factors of this with tiny epsilons. Then we put in complete sets of states, and that got us to this path integral formula. That's how the thing was derived. And now, in as much as j is time independent, there's no time there. Um, the the um, this this structure, or or put it differently, this structure, in fact, is just the trace of e to the minus beta h divided by the trace of e to the minus beta h zero, where this is h zero and that's h. and we're taking the limit as beta goes to infinity, the beta going to infinity is the same thing as this. So that, that's beta, that's effectively beta. In both cases, we have something going to infinity. So I've tried to make that a little bit clearer. Um, is, this, is this more or less okay, or is it, is, is it still very cloudy? Um, Now, remember when we did this, when we, when we developed these path integrals, what we were doing was we were either taking matrix elements of e to the i th or e to the minus of beta h. This is basically what we were dealing with. And we were inserting complete sets of states. And when, if we had a time ordered product of fields, then, or some functional fields, the fields were just stuck in there and um, it would be like e to the minus 
minus T1. Actually, I'll be getting to this later in the lecture in a, in a more careful way. So let, let, let me not try to, to, to wing that part of it. All right, I, I, I think I made this as clear as I can right now. Let me go back now to the discussion of functional differentiation that we were doing on, on Wednesday. Um, we, and then let me remind you of how this goes. Um, one notation was if g of f is a functional, then this variational derivative was taken this way. The derivative of an epsilon equal to zero and the way we were, in, in, in physics notation, it would be this. Variation of the functional, the variational derivative with respect to, let us say, f of y is then, in this notation, And h here is um, would be delta of x minus y. And so this would be d by d epsilon of g of f plus epsilon delta of x minus y epsilon equal to zero. Notation here is a little bit mixed. Um, to make it really nice, I should use a notation. Delta sub y is the function of delta of x minus y. And then I would have written this as delta sub y. Um, and this one also delta sub y. <coughs> In other words, in the, in the functional notation, you write the function without the argument. That's all, that's all I mean there. And we considered um, second order functionals. And this was just the second order. Last time, in fact, I think the, the lecture ended by noticing that this would have been um, something that was positive for the functional uh, that was just um, the functional just being q dot squared integrated over time. So let's 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 now instead consider the following s of q. This would be an integral of a half q dot squared minus v of q dt. So this is sort of a standard action, classical action for a particle. Oh, left out the mass. V half mq dot squared minus v of q. And um, so let's compute the second derivative of this, the second functional derivative of this. So this would be d2, d epsilon squared. So is um, h just like a dummy variable that we're seeking in? Excuse me? Is the h just a dummy variable sort of thing that we're seeking in? h is just another function. And it's, in other words, this second variational derivative in general, it depends upon, is a function of two functions, f and h. Does it matter what h is? And, and in this particular, excuse me? Does it matter what h is? Is it what? Does it matter what function h is? h is an arbitrary function. Yeah, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. It, right. Doesn't matter. So it's just a dummy function. Yeah, it's a dummy function. Correct. Um, I'm, 
I'm, I'm sorry, give me that again. So it would be let, just, me just, let me just finish writing this formula. Okay, what now? So it is in fact just a dummy function. You can just think of it as a dummy function, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's not playing a, a, an important role where, I mean, the functional, you know, like if you have a function, f of x, x is the variable, and for any old x, you have f of x, you know, like x squared, okay? And so here, this is a, fun a functional of um, a function h. And in, in when, when, we, when we go to the normal physics notation, we replace x by basically delta of x minus y, or delta of t minus t prime, or something like that. Let's see, I owe you at least one chocolate. In fact, I think I owe you two, so... Uh, is it supposed to be V dot? No, there's no V dot. There's a, a dots here, no dots there. V is the potential energy. But you don't differentiate it with respect to... Oh, no, the, yeah, sorry. I'm differentiating here. Oh, I see, yes, yeah, so there's dots because they're already in yeah, right. Right. So obviously this thing, I mean, you just expand this, you get the q dot squared, it has no epsilon derivative, so that's it, that contributes zero. The linear term is uh, two q dot epsilon h dot, but the second derivative is like epsilon zero, that doesn't contribute. What contributes is one half m epsilon squared h dot squared, the second derivative with respect to epsilon, the two cancels, the epsilon goes away, and we get an integral dt m h dot squared. Now for this one, we write v of q plus epsilon h as v of q plus epsilon h v prime of q plus a half epsilon <coughs> squared h squared v double prime of q plus higher order terms. So we write this as a Taylor series. Then the only term that contributes when you take derivative, the second derivative, epsilon equals zero is this term. And so this gives us minus h squared partial 2v partial q squared and I have a 2 here. Ah, right, because when we uh, did, we had, so we have a 1 half there, but now when we differentiate with respect to epsilon, the 2 goes away, and so we just get a minus. So there is a typo in these notes. I have an extra factor of 2. So this is the answer. And in particular, if we did the, a sort of physics notation, the second derivative, the second functional derivative with respect to, say, uh, delta, with respect to, um, well, we'd say essentially q um, of y, of q of t prime, say then this would be um, we replace h by delta of uh, t minus t prime and um, hmm, this would be this would be this, uh, this wasn't in the notes so I'm sort of reading this this, yeah, this, this might be infinite here. Let, let's let's skip this for the delta case and just just observe what this is. The point is this can be either positive or negative um, because although this term is positive, that term is negative. Oh, well, no, it's it's indefinite. D2, D, D2B, DQ squared can be either positive or negative, and then you have a minus sign here. So this 
the sum, second functional derivative can be um, can be either way. Whereas for the for the case in which there's no v, then the second functional derivative was positive, and so uh, any change in the action in, in the path away from the stationary path raised the raised the action. Anyway, the nth functional derivative is defined as g of f and h, and this is the nth derivative. It's just an obvious extension of g of f plus epsilon h at, again, epsilon b to 0. And if we take as an example the functional if we say g sub n of f is the functional f to the nth power of x d, um, dx, then um, what we get is that this nth uh, little n or big N fh is n factorial over n minus n factorial an integral of um, f n minus n of x h n of x dx. So that's that's how that works. Now, what this gives us is the possibility of defining a functional Taylor series or Taylor series and functional derivatives, and. Um, So, in particular, we could say e to the delta on the functional g of f and h is then a sum of all of these various functional derivatives and this is then a sum 1 over n factorial dn d epsilon to the n of g of f plus epsilon h. Again, at epsilon equal to 0. And this, in fact, is just g of f plus epsilon h. So in particular, so I can say, how do you come up with that third line? So let me, let me just note that there's an epsilon there that shouldn't be there. What? I'm not seeing how you got from the second line to the third line. You mean going from here to here? Right. Essentially, you have a series of 
Yeah. Yes. Definition of Taylor series. Taylor expansion. If you look at the, the last step and uh, expand, expand it to the uh, last second step and the several years. So you agree that it's fine? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Um, let's let's look at an example of it in the in a quadratic case where it's simple. Okay. Um, so let's say e to the delta on s zero of q and h. So this. This only this thing is just a simple free action. <laughs> so this is just one plus d e by dx one plus a half d two d epsilon squared on s zero uh, of q plus epsilon h epsilon equals zero. So this is m and and let me just say that s so s zero of q m over 2 integral q dot squared dt. So this is m over 2 integral 1 plus d by d epsilon plus a half d2 d epsilon squared q dot of t plus epsilon h dot of t squared dt epsilon equal to zero. Okay, so what is this? This is equal to, so let me just write it up here, equal to m over 2 integral dt Q dot squared of T plus 2 Q dot of T H dot of T. So that's the first derivative term only or only works for uh, it's only the cross term that contributes there. And then plus H dot squared of T. And now we see that this is m over 2 integral dt of t dot of t plus h dot of t squared, which is s0 of q plus h. So this is an example of this general assertion. Now, I think it follows that the these glasses aren't really helping me. The, uh, I, I think it follows that in the same way for higher terms that you get this. Um, now, um, if Q makes uh, this action stationary, then um, then uh, in fact this thing would equal S0 of Q plus S0 of H because the, the this term here would vanish. Um, But more generally, what we have is S of Q plus H is E to the delta S of Q H. And then this is S of Q plus a sum. Again, this is if Q is, is Q makes the action stationary. So Q is a class of the path, then this would be 1 over n factorial dn d epsilon to the n of s of q plus epsilon h epsilon equal to 
zero. And in the case when it's quadratic, then you get s of q plus s of h. But this is just um, in the quadratic case. So I'll put a two here. So if q is stationary, then s of q plus h is the sum of these two. Of course, if q is not stationary, then this equation is not true because the linear term doesn't go away. All right, so now I want to um, shift to uh, functional differential equations. And these are things that you learned about in quantum mechanics um, in one form, and I'm going to extend it to quantum field theory now, and um, derive a nice formula for the, the vacuum <coughs> wave function, the wave function of the vacuum in, uh, again, a free field theory, so one that we can actually work out. So, is there any question before I go on? Yeah. I'm, I'm sure I'm just misunderstanding. But in the uh, second to bottom line on the board. Here? Yeah, that, that term that you're pointing at, actually. How do you, how, how did that? How did I get this? Not that, I understand the like, differentiation of the second term, but the m h dot squared. Well, there was an m here. Yeah. One half, and, and here, you, you have then here epsilon squared, h dot squared, you take the second derivative with respect to epsilon, that gives you then uh, a oh, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Is that what I did, Chocolate? Yes. Another thing that I think you're missing. So on the third one on the right side of that chalkboard, you have S0 of q plus h equals S0 of Q plus S0 of H. I'm not saying how you're getting that because... Well, this is, this, is, this is just for the case where Q is stationary. Okay. If Q is stationary, then this term is zero. Okay. <coughs> and I'm also assuming... Excuse me, close this term. Okay. Uh, there's something else. I'm assuming that uh, H vanishes at the end point. And... Um, I don't, I, haven't, I, don't, I haven't thought about how general that is, but um, it, it could be that this whole formalism only really works if H vanishes at the end point of the integration, or if we can throw away surface terms when we integrate by parts. But H is a just a dummy function that we made up for the purpose of this process, can't we? Just to find it in such a way that it does something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if there's a problem, we'll do that. Okay, now let's go back to quantum mechanics for a moment. Quantum mechanics, we have inner products like this. Q prime F. So this is this we can think of that as F of Q prime. And this is sort of the wave function of uh, some state f. And we represent the momentum operator as h bar over i d by dq, or d by dq prime. When I say q prime, it's to distinguish the a particular variable q prime from the operator q. And the reason this makes sense, as you know from your studies of quantum mechanics, is that if we write it as, if you take the matrix element of Q between the states Q prime and F, and notice, of course, here, Q on Q prime is Q prime, Q prime. So Q prime is an eigenstate of the, of the position operator. Then we could write this as h bar over i d by dq prime of q 
prime QF. On the other hand, this is H bar over I D D Q prime of Q prime Q prime F because just taking the adjoint of this equation, in other words, Q prime Q is equal to Q prime Q prime. So that gives us this. And now differentiating what we get is H bar over I plus Q prime H bar over I D by D Q prime Q prime F. And so this is basically telling us that Q prime PQ F is equal to um, Q prime H bar over I and this is QP whoops plus QP F in other words I can write this as H, H bar over I uh, so you need a Q prime wait, 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 let, let me just let me just Or let me do it this way. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, there, there should be a Q prime F with the first term. Q prime A Q prime where? Is that a Q prime here? No. Yeah, a Q prime F. Inner product of Q prime. So, because if you're doing H bar over I. All right, let's see. We agree with this, right? Yeah. And so this gives us that. No. no. All right, I don't think that, that first term needs a Q prime F in your product. Yeah. H, H over I plus right times Q prime F. Well, the, the derivative acts on Q prime that. Oh! Pause, oh, sorry. Duh. Yeah, the notes are right. All right, let me write it this way. That's what I've said to you many times. When my left hand is down, you have to watch out. Well, it's so, in fact, let's rewrite this. So now it actually looks better than I don't even need to write this down. So in other words, the reason why we get away with this in quantum mechanics is that this trick here respects the commutation relation, which is PQ is equal to H bar over I plus QP. And the normal way that people write this is QP minus PQ is equal to I H bar or the commutator of Q with P is equal to I H bar. So I threw the H bar back in. I normally set it equal to 1, but um, because this is quantum mechanics, I just thought it would look a little bit more familiar. Well, we can repeat this same, uh, the same uh, way of thinking and way of dealing with things uh, as we generalize from a single variable Q to a variable Q associated with every space point which we call a field phi of x at say time zero. Thinking of this as the position operator at time zero then this is the field at time zero. And when we do this then what we have is a field Unfortunately, I put in, I don't know why I put, well, I guess I want an equal time commutator. Okay, so we, we can say phi of x and t, but frankly, I'm normally thinking of t equals zero here. But just because the notes are this way, why don't I do it this way? 
we can then have an eigenstate and um, then what will we do, what will be the analog of this? Well, it's the pi of x at the same time, and I'm thinking of this mainly as t equals zero. Well, it's h bar over i, the variational derivative with respect to v prime of uh, x. So, question again. Yeah. Why are we kicking out the t from that equation to the pi of x? You know, I, 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 I in fact would rather set this at equal to zero. Right. So let's just put the time zero, or think of that as a space variable. And let's do the same thing here. I think putting in time was making things more complicated. So is this the, uh, what's it called, uh, there's a parity operator? Well, let's not bring parity in here. I, I don't think there's anything to do with parity. Oh, pi is not parity. No, pi is the is, pi is the momentum operator. It's the analog in field theory of p. And just as p is h bar over i d by dq, so to pi is h bar over i a variational derivative. It's just that in quantum two, use pi for commutation. Yeah, well, some people would use pi for parity, but I'm not doing that. And now, why does this work? Well, these erasers are nice and simply at some point. Well, they show up often. works is the same as the reason why the, the analogous thing works in quantum mechanics. <coughs> we take phi prime, phi of x prime, so everything's a space variable, all the operators are t equals zero, phi of x, some state f, and so we're going to say this is h bar over i, the variational derivative with respect to phi prime of x prime, this x prime, of phi prime phi of x f. And now this is going to be h bar over i, this variational derivative. And what we're going to have here is phi prime of x times the matrix element phi prime f. And now we can think of this as h bar over i integral delta of x minus x prime phi prime of x d cubed x prime phi prime f and this will give us h bar over i delta of x minus x prime plus phi prime of x the variational derivative And so this is phi prime minus i h bar, I've just brought the i up, delta x minus x prime plus phi of x, phi of x prime f. And so this gives us the equal time commutation relation 
phi of x, phi of x prime is i h bar delta x minus x prime. And this is, and all the operators are at time zero. Mexico, and um, 
I think they were down at an airfield in El Gordo, and the village was somewhere out in the desert, away from El Gordo. Okay, so they were loading this back cage with the phosphorus into the plane, and somebody slipped, and they dropped the thing, and the the doors swung open, the bats flew out. And they were still near Alamogordo, so the bats flew into Alamogordo, among other places. They went to many places. Some of them went to, and they started fires in the city of Alamogordo. Well, the government covered this up by saying that there were just some random fires and there's no word about bats or phosphorus. But they thought, well, they had a surefire device. And so the next step was to drop it over Japan. And they actually did that. However, it didn't work. The reason it didn't work is that the bomber that they used did not have, had, didn't have, um, didn't have pressurized air inside the plane. I think the pilots were just breathing oxygen through, through, through masks, or the part that was pressurized was just where the people were, not where the bombs were. So the bats fell asleep because of the low oxygen level. Then they dropped the cage went down a thousand feet, the doors opened, but the bats were sound asleep. And went all the way down and just crashed into the ground. And so they decided that, well, this was one clever idea that maybe wasn't yet ready for crime time. So the Japanese thought we were just dropping canisters. What? So the Japanese just thought we were dropping canisters of dead bats. Well, well, I think it was just one uh, one bad case came down. We wonder what that was. Um, Anyway, I have other stories, but um, that will be for another day. So let's now try to use this formalism. Let's consider once again our soluble Hamiltonian, which is pi squared plus grad phi squared plus m squared phi squared d cubed x with the one half out in front. This is the analog of the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian p squared over 2m plus a half omega squared q squared with an m that I forgot. All right. Now, I'm going to show you how to do it for the field theory case, but first I want to remind you how it works, a, a cute way of doing the harmonic oscillator problem. Um, so let me write it this way. We can factor this. It's 1 over 2m, m omega q minus ip, m omega q plus ip, plus i omega over 2 pq, or pq over <coughs> constant. And so this is, in fact, 1 over 2m. Let me just write it here. And this term is a half h bar omega. Okay, so we want what will be the lowest energy state. This thing is positive because this is an operator. This is the adjoint of the operator. Adjoint of an operator times an operator. That's something that's non-negative. And so the lowest energy state will be one that this annihilates if there is such a state. And so we seek a state such that m omega q plus i p on this state is zero. Well, that is just the statement m omega q prime plus h bar d by d q prime on q prime zero. zero. Okay. Well, that's a simple differential equation. This is the kind that you pray for on a math exam. So this is d by dq prime of q prime zero is minus m omega q prime over h bar q prime zero. The solution is q prime zero is e to the minus 
m omega q prime squared over 2h bar. And if you want to normalize it directly, it's m omega over pi h bar to the 1 quarter. All right, so that's a nice way of doing the harmonic and oscillator problem. And by the way, um, years ago, maybe 30 years ago, Witten showed that you could do supersymmetric quantum mechanics in rather the same way. And um, that's actually a sort of nice um, simple formalism. Symmetry is something that nature uses, is still um, unknown experimentally. In fact, all the experimental evidence is pointing in the other direction. But it might be true. Anyway, so let's let's now take our Hamiltonian here and let's factorize it the way we factorize the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. So then what we do is we say h is a half integral square root of minus grad squared plus m squared phi minus i pi minus grad squared plus m squared phi plus i pi d cubed x plus some constant, the constant turns out to be infinite. It's one of the embarrassing features of aspects of quantum field theory. Um, but anyway, it's, it's in fact basically a sum of one half h bar omega over all the modes. But let's, let's not think about that at the moment because that will distract us. Then, if we want this to annihilate, this is a positive operator here, if we want this to annihilate the state, then uh, what do we have? Well, we have the equation. What we want is phi prime square root of minus rad squared plus m squared phi plus i pi, and now vacuum equal to zero. That's what we want. And so what does this say? Well, this is the same thing as um, Wait a minute. So if you multiply the square root of negative L squared plus m squared by itself on the other side, you get negative del squared plus m squared. Yeah. But you have a positive del squared in the original term. Well, it's you mean if you integrated by pods and brought this over so that you would have you would have phi minus rad squared plus m squared <coughs> phi. I mean you'd have something like that. Um, no. I mean you're yeah. right. This is what you'd have. Okay? Yeah, but I mean but this, this, if you then integrate by parts, this thing is minus grad phi, grad phi plus m squared phi squared. You integrate this by parts, that's what that is. Oh, I'm sorry, the plus sign here. And so this is positive. And the reason why. I don't hesitate here is that minus rad squared is a positive operator. The second derivative is intrinsically negative. At least if you have something that, you know, if you could drop surface terms. The second derivative is intrinsically negative. Hmm. All right, so let's see. We're was I? So what is this uh, equation? This would be square root of minus Laplacian minus grad squared plus m squared phi prime 
and now we have plus i pi. Well, this this is i, the variational derivative with respect to uh, phi of um, of x of phi prime. I left something out here. This is phi prime, phi prime zero plus i this phi prime zero. Or in other words, we have the differential equation, the variational derivative of phi prime zero with respect to phi prime of x is minus the square root of minus squared squared plus m squared by prime of x, by prime zero. And the answer then is phi prime zero is some normalization factor, e to the minus one half integral phi prime of x square root of minus rad squared plus m squared by prime of x so that's what the ground state wave function of is for this theory, um, which is a you know, theory of a free scalar field. On the second line, is that um, the functional derivative with respect to phi, with respect to phi prime? The second line on the board. Uh, I'm sorry. Up, up the line from there. Here. And then to that function derivative. I was just check. Prime, you mean? Is, is that right? Sure. Yeah. Sorry, I left it out. <laughs> God, it almost hit you. Sorry. Fortunately, these things are light and relatively soft. So if we make a mistake. All right, let me just show by explicit functional differentiation that this ground state wave function does satisfy the um, <coughs> differential equation. So let us compute the what we want to show is that this satisfies this functional differential equation. And so what is that thing? Well, it's d by d epsilon of phi prime plus epsilon h zero. And that would be n d by d epsilon of e to the minus one half integral phi prime plus epsilon h minus Laplacian plus m squared. Laplacian is the same thing as grad squared. I somehow switched notation in the middle of this derivation here. And of course, at epsilon equals to zero. So what does this give us? An n a minus one half And um, well, let me, let me get right at the way it's written in the notes. It's integral h of x here we get the first term, if the derivative acts here we get the second term, 
we then set epsilon equal to zero and we recover as phi prime zero. Um, on the other hand, if we uh, integrate by parts, we see that this is equal to just minus the integral of h of x prime. Well, or h of x, we don't really need to be. Um, well, if I follow the notes, it's h of x prime, but I don't see why. Like this is kind of silly. Let me get rid of the primes. Well, all right. I don't know. Anyway, we get this expression here, and um, if we now let h of x prime be delta of x minus x prime, then what we get is the variational derivative of phi prime zero with respect to phi prime for x is minus the square root of minus the plus m, plus m squared phi prime of x and then phi prime zero. So this does satisfy the functional differential um, equation. And now some of you may be puzzle, what the heck is this minus square root of Poisson plus m squared on this? The way to see what it is much more clearly is to go to momentum space. So let me, in the next three minutes, do that. So if we go to momentum space, Let's say five prime of x be an integral e to the i p x. This is three-dimensional. Phi tilde prime of p d q p over two pi q. Then what is this phi prime zero? Well, it turns out it's n e to the minus one half integral five prime tilde at p absolute value squared times the square root of p squared plus m squared dqp where this is just a normalization constant so the function is normalized in a functional sense. So you see, this is very nice. Um, this is square root of p squared plus m squared. So this is the energy of a particle of mass m momentum p. The amplitude for that dqp e to the minus that. And um, so, so when you use this, when you write it this way, everything is perfectly understandable. This is a functional of a function phi prime of p, or phi prime tilde of p, and the function of whether you e to the minus a half, you integrate over all momenta, absolute value squared, and then the energy. So it makes perfect sense there. Whereas, I can well imagine that some of you were kind of baffled by what this is sort of confusing. And I remember when I was a graduate student, I first saw that. I um, had very queasy feelings. Um, all right, I think I'll skip the rest of this, um, <coughs> the rest of this chapter. And um, what I plan to do next is to Go so back to the path integrals and um, do the path integrals in um, Minkowski space, that is to say ordinary space time, so that we'll have E to the I kind of the action. Um, and uh, that's the formalism that 
Z more or less uses, it uses most of the time. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, no? Okay. You do have a question. Yeah. What? So, can, can, can I see a few words about the operators in the topography of theory? Um, I assume the last of mechanics we use in Amber, the topography of mechanics we use in Amber. Thank you. Yeah.